Sitting Comfortably Podcasts by Laurel Lindstrom. Are we sitting comfortably? Then I'll begin. The Draftsman, Chapter 1, Arrivals. Through dark glasses he saw himself reflected in the rear-view mirror, and beyond his view tall cedar trees, black against the early spring sky, reflected in glossy new red paintwork. Rain droplets distorted, outlining alien reflections backed with red. From another life, he was sitting in a black cab and through another mirror watching his dad smoking. Dad was telling him all about Trotsky's betrayals, miasma tales floating in the nicotine haze. A slight shake of the head and he pushed his stick-straight hair out of his eyes, glanced back at nothing and switched off the growling engine. Sitting still, suspended, in a moment he stared at the ugly bungalow in front of him, flat, sprawling, a spreading mass of rain-washed red brick, weeds and tarmac, shadows of dirty newsprint grey, offensive. This is it. This is where it all starts, he whispered, apprehensive, unconvinced. At the front door, his sister was waiting in welly boots and too much scarf rising up around her neck in a wave of woolly beige. She was standing still but somehow moving, an energetic excitement shimmying and almost visible. He thinks fleeting and ugly anti-Alison thoughts but calls out instead, Hey, Alison, how's it going? Alison is large, with the same stick-straight hair as her brother. It is expertly dyed, a butter mousse, burnt caramel at the roots, long and full of swing. The merging scarf gave her a curious, top-heavy aspect, an inverted, slightly wavering pyramid anchored in Wellingtons. Tending middling to heavy, she should have gone for a loose and flowing look, but instead she went for slightly too tight trousers and short crop cardigans to show off her curves and balance her big hair. She was cradling the phone awkwardly under her left ear while holding it with her right. Struggling to keep her large leather bag on her shoulder, she listed slightly as she walked towards him, ungainly and slightly knock-kneed in her rubber boots. Martin figured that whatever she was talking about probably needed a tight grip. Her husband, maybe, or Joshua, or more likely Martin himself. All smiles, she finished her call and beamed a gushing welcome, arms open, with heavy bag and scarf a confused tangle slipping from her shoulder. Awkward and stomping a few paces towards him before the effort got too much, she called, You're here! You're finally here! It's just so exciting, isn't it? You know you're going to love it down here, don't you? You know it'll do you so much good. Tiny, whinnying titters filled the breathy spaces, between her words, but the force of her enthusiasm was exhausting and Martin was unconvinced, certain that neither of them really knew what would do him good or what would not. He looked at the graceless house he had bought six months ago and reminded himself that it would all start here. It had to start. Something had to change. He had to change. Somehow he had to move on, although he wasn't entirely sure why or to what. This place could be his isolation, his misery even, but it would also be a place of silence where he could perhaps ease the elastic twisted around his fervid brain, make other choices, breathe. The house, low and grovelling, looked similarly spent and empty. It was unwritten space, long since exhausted. In close, frigid touch with the ground, it was nearly dead. He felt his own chilled life like condensation dribbling slow and cold away from him into the same close, frigid touch with the ground. The bungalow was built in the 60s, a perfect square with six bedrooms, bathrooms, sitting room, dining room and kitchen arranged along each of its four sides with a courtyard in the centre. The rooms shared a common internal hallway with metal framed windows all around to let light into the house's interior. In the middle of each of the four sides, a door opened out onto the courtyard. Viewed from the outside, the house appeared to sprawl, the effect of its lowness to the ground and dimension. From the inside, 
It felt constricted, as if it were four rectangles, clumsily bolted together, a prison instead of a unified, single space. Surrounding it were 60 acres of parkland, woods, narrow, deep rivers, feeding a pair of artificial lakes. Turning his back while his sister fiddled with her noisy phone, Martin lit another cigarette and stared, slightly dazed, out across the parkland. Listless grass sloped down towards a half mile of drive and the twisting lane running wonkily perpendicular back to the village he'd just driven through. Pretty, but with a desolate air, Catstown had brick pavements, terraced cottages standing in a defiant row along a busy main road, pollarded lime trees and four pubs, a butcher and a bakery come tea shop. A village shop, a post office, a greengrocer's, the usual village street furniture, framed glass windows, signs in peeling paints over doorways, litter bins and a narrow set of brick steps facing the road as an aid to horse riders who couldn't reach their feet up high enough to mount on their own. Browning goods were displayed on stalls on the pavement under a constant low-level waft of diesel particles and petrol fumes, blessings from the traffic as it continued its steady exodus to more important places. As Martin had nosed his snorting monster, snarling and chafing in second gear along the high street, it seemed to him that the people moved too slowly, remote and distant, soundless players on stage, caught in a jail of their own making. Facing his new landscape, Martin saw that the park had been left long alone. Random bramble patches, chainsawed tree stumps, fractured and wounded, their broken branches drowning deep in weeds dragged down with the rain, slowly dying and too tired to fight back any more. He scraped out the dead cigarette with his boot, lit another and shifted slightly sideways to face the lake, lifeless and bleak. Beyond it, bordering the lane, Martin could see a sagging fence, overstrewn with dead grass in a feigned and reluctant embrace and marking his boundary. The original Shadowhurst Hall had been much grander, a Victorian pile that was an altogether more complicated place. Three stories high, cellars and elaborate terracing, stone stairways, balustrades, wine cellars and an orangery. Various exotic outbuildings and follies once peppered the grounds, but now most of the outside structures were gone or derelict, along with the thousand-acre farm, its barns, stables and pony paddocks, all long since sold on. Old photos showed faux half-timbering and rectangular towers and a too small front door giving the house a pinched and mean expression. Pictures of burly men sweating in the summer heat show them standing rigid and still in front of the house, staring black-eyed and anonymous. When Joshua showed him pictures of the place, Martin had remembered thinking about all those long-since dead and over lives and all that orangery glass ripe for smashing. The noise would have been magnificent, and the silence was seductive. Martin's business minder was a man whose age was middling old, but not too old. Joshua Fothergill understood the workings of Martin's peculiar intelligence, but not much else about him, despite their five or so year working relationship. Where Alison saw obsessiveness, Joshua Fothergill recognised an insatiable need for resolutions, black and white, true and false, but never greys or abstractions. If she saw decadence and decay, Joshua got laziness, apathy, a sense of immunity. In that he was wrong, but he did at least understand something about the static, the binary confusions, the need to see black and white resolve. With Alison, Joshua had a singular relationship, part competitive, part parental, the bigger part friends, united in mutual love for Martin. They had met when Joshua's firm was instructed to advise Martin and his boss as to the options so suddenly available to them. Joshua wrote the contract and associated paperwork and had looked after Martin's interests ever since. Those early contracts were the start and Shadowhurst was to become the latest twist in their shared journey. Martin remembered how, careful and precise in new brogues and country tweeds to match the conversation, Joshua had paper-clicked the house pictures to his recommendations for Martin's offer. 
his soft pink lips had moved slowly behind the reddish beard and moustache, and his brow was tight in concentration as he explained in subdued and careful tones the various propositions. Detailed and with several alternative financial models ranging from dull to exciting, they all led to Martin buying Shadowhurst. Though he did not mention it, Joshua was in favour because financially this was a good investment. Joshua was also in favour because of the delicious prospect of long weekends and swimming in the lakes, walks to the pub and other vaguely rural pursuits they could share. Out of London, there would be less noise, more intimacy and more time for those special moments he always hoped were on their way. Joshua was perpetually walking towards them, but like walking towards a massive monument from the wrong end of a distant avenue. No matter how fast he walked, he never seemed to arrive. 